So I saw this report the other day, a lot of parents, community members with questions about what's going on in Portland in regards to grades and late policies and, and, and things like that. So I, I just wanted to open up with a video to give some context and then we'll talk about it from there. It's assessing mastery and accuracy. For students across the country, missed assignments usually turn into zeros in the grade book. But in a couple of years, that could change for Portland Public School students. Zeros are usually inaccurate, right? Assigning a, a zero um, to a student then throws off the whole grading scale and doesn't accurately report out what a student's able to do. A handout for Portland Public Schools states the new system wouldn't take into account a student's behavior when it comes to their grades. If implemented, students wouldn't be scored on participation and effort. Students would also not be penalized for late work. The framework instructs teachers to assign a grade of at least 50% to work that doesn't meet expectations, is incomplete or missing. Yeah, interesting. Grades are based on valid evidence of a student's content knowledge, not evidence that is likely to be influenced by teachers' implicit bias or reflect a student's environment. Interesting. Practices to reduce bias include summative assessments, okay, homework, late work, no extra credit. So, so this stuff, I think, is pretty much like the floor for grading reform, right? Isn't this like 10 years ago what um, kind of the push towards standards-based grading was about? N not penalizing late work, not offering extra credit, excluding academic factors. This, this, is a, this is a new video from 2023, you're saying? Yeah, this is just being implemented in the last, like, week. Anybody is going to be resistant to change, but at the same time, these are changes that they're they're catching up from from at least a decade ago. I mean, it's certainly radical, though, in terms of a large public school district to say that there's no graded homework. Um, you can't include participation within your grading scheme. The big ones that people are really honing in on is the fact that you don't get a zero for cheating. And there's no penalty for late. work. I think those are the two that are really uh, kind of putting people out. Do note. It isn't that there's no consequences for cheating. It's just that you right. don't get a zero in the grade book automatically because as right. they're getting at here, one zero for any assignment has massive implications for um, your future. And we've been talking about this for years that zeros on report cards or Fs on assignments do not encourage you to do better in the future. So what is the point of them? You could right. see them as a series of punishments, like how, how dare you do poorly on this work and therefore you deserve an F. But right. if our goal is to have students learn things, we know that Fs on report cards lead to less participation in the future. This has been studied. We had, we had the researcher on our podcast that, that wrote about this. Um, and anecdotally, we all know that's true. I've, I've never seen a student fail out on a report card and then all of a sudden come back second semester and be like, you know, I'm really going to work harder this semester <laughs> and do a lot better. Exactly. Give up. Hey, quick note from future editing Chris here. Quick note, because we always forget to ask, but please make sure you like and subscribe to this video. It's kind of a meme on YouTube, but the vast majority of folks who watch our videos are not subscribed. And if you could hit that subscribe button and like our content, if you appreciate it, it would make a world of difference. So thanks again and enjoy the rest of the video. Whether or not a student does things on time is less important than what they do do. The framework also tells teachers not to grade homework. Group grades would not be included in an individual student's grade. Cheating would be penalized through disciplinary action, but not through grades. Armstrong says the new grading system would make the system fairer because students have different responsibilities outside of school. It's about fairness. It's about reducing bias. It's about considering the diverse backgrounds and needs of students. Some parents say the new system would instead encourage students to not complete their work. Uh, a is effort, you know, and F is failing. And so if a child doesn't do the work, you know, they need to get an F. Lamar Hardy is a parent of two elementary schoolers in the district. He says finishing work on time is a skill set learned in school. That's responsibility. That's how we teach our kids responsibility. PPS instructional framework instructs teachers to be persistent in not allowing students to opt out of assignments. But Armstrong says students proficient in a subject would not be penalized for not completing assignments. The practicing of the skill is different than showing mastery of it. And that's really what we want to happen. So really quick, a note on this, which I think is where 
perhaps the context is lost and and why it's really important to communicate these ideas clearly is that you can say that late work doesn't impact your grade while simultaneously still teaching kids the importance of turning work on time. It, it's just like with any input and output, the more variables you try to throw in there, the less accurate any communication about that variable is going to be. So do you have an 88% because you turned in a late assignment or because you didn't understand a, a particular concept? Now, I want to clarify what the gentleman was speaking to there, and 50% is still an F. So if you turn in, uh, if you have missing work um, and it goes in as a 50, that still is an F on a zero to 100 grading scale. But I think what we're going to end up getting to is that a lot of these complaints and criticisms are really criticisms of a zero to 100 point grading scale because it just doesn't make sense. There. I mean, we, we would take this to even a point further of this yeah. is a, I mean, it's a solid step. Like I'm, I'm down with a lot of the things that they're saying, sure. but ultimately at the end of the day, why are we even giving like this would be solved by having student portfolios, by having students communicate through narrative assessment, right. by doing like it, work that's going on at the mastery transcript regarding changing up how letter grades are given altogether. And there's a, a political notion of this as well. I did want to pull this in before I just look at the before we just look at the Oregon, the Washington free beacon covering the enemies of freedom the way the mainstream media won't. Um, what? This was just from you know a couple months ago. It's talking about how Portland Public Schools is workshopping new equitable grading practices that bar teachers from assigning zeros who cheat or fail to turn assignments. To and I feel like real quick here, I feel like just just off the top that 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 framing is in the first sentence for a reason, right? Like putting equitable in there has become such a dog whistle code word for you know, pe people of a particular reactionary persuasion to Im immediately dismiss something if it's in the cause, explicit cause of equity. Right. And this is obviously like a highly biased report. It's talking about how yeah. oh, it, no, it, it, Erica compares, the, oh, geez. It, it compares equitable outcomes amongst all students with the fact that, you know, California now has the equity math curriculum, which is in part due to Joe Bowler's work, which is honestly incredible. <laughs> it's really good stuff. These equitable grading policies, however well intended, are a disaster for the students who struggle most and for the students who need accelerated coursework. So it's very interesting that they reached out to Erica Sanzi. I think she just became one of these kind of like moms for liberty types in the culture war era because she kind of rose up through that. There is not a culture war issue that she would not jump into. I mean, she's pro book bans. She's like anti CRT. I think a lot of it was like, it may be anti-vax, maybe anti-COVID kind of stuff, you know? Um, she's definitely like a culture warrior. She's like reporting on stuff about this quote-unquote narrative yeah. of systemic racism. Um, so kind of leaning into yeah. like... So she's an interesting source exist. to reach out to for ideas about the Portland education system. But let's just go through, I guess, from the, the screenshots here that we do have. There's no group grades. Um, into individual grades, which fine. I I, I feel like that yep. was a thing twenty or thirty years ago. Um, I don't really. It doesn't always really seem like anyone's taking issue with that. Sure, whatever. Content being bias resistant, so removing elements that have nothing to do with the academic content knowledge. You want grades to be based on summative assessment. We're huge advocates of a portfolio based system where you're taking the the sum of its parts rather than the individual things that could just harm kids motivation to succeed homework which we have a whole video on on why homework is not an effective educational tool late work again that's like a big one is there's no penalty for students assigning late work for grades doesn't mean that there's no pen penalties at all it's just that there's no penalty from a right. grading perspective on late work there's no extra credit which again, I feel like this has been a thing for like 30 or 40 years, people talking about why it doesn't make any sense to assign extra credit, excluding non-academic factors. So not including participation, attendance, effort, attitude, behavior, or other non-academic factors. Again, if our goal is to show content knowledge, these types of non-academic factors impact like neurodivergent students, um, students who struggle with participating in class for various different reasons, um, who can't attend school easily. Like I mean, they already said it, it's, you know, it's, it's more equitable. And then there's, again, there's still consequences for cheating, but there you just don't right. get a zero on the assignment. Let's game this out real quick, right? The punishment for cheating is that you don't have to do the assignment. 
well, that's great because they didn't do it in the first place. <laughs> so the, the, an adequate punishment, right, for a kid who didn't want to do an assignment or for a kid who, again, like let's, let's throw malevolent intentions out the window and just think like they didn't have time, they didn't feel supported, they, they were rushed, they didn't understand it, all those other kinds of variables. And just say like, well, no, your punishment is that you have to do the assignment the right way and do the learning, right? The punishment is to um, learn the stuff you're supposed to learn. That way you can be successful in the future. The easy thing to do is to just get a zero. The kid doesn't have to do the learning and you all get to move on with your life. We saw this firsthand. The kids that participate in ungraded classrooms that are moving away from grades in this way, and it gets into here in the motivational section where they talk about retakes, um, normalizing feedback, uh, utilizing like clear rubrics, et cetera it's more rigorous to be in a classroom that does this stuff because you have to redo your stuff. You can't just accept a C and move on. You have to constantly be implementing feedback. You have to listen to feedback and what's being said to you. You have to produce the best possible outcome as opposed to turning in an assignment two days late, getting a C and then going, okay, what's the next one? If an F is anything below 60, that means that 60% of that grading scale is defined by failure. All right. And only 40 percent is the gradations of acceptable grades. OK, so how much sense does it make to even turn in an assignment and get a 27 percent? That basic that might as well just be a zero. Right. A 50 percent might as well just be a zero because it all defines the same thing. You don't get it. They still have all of these gradations right. like that's that's not what's changing here. Right. What's changing here is the ability that students have to right. get into these gradations to begin with. And I think getting back to your earlier point about how this plays out, let's just imagine two different scenarios, right? In the old system, you didn't do your homework and you get a zero uh, on that assignment. And maybe your, your grade is like 10% of your grade is based off of homework as it is in, in a lot of different classrooms. So now, you have a permanent mark on your grade that's going to lower you from maybe let's say a B minus to a C sure. plus um, on your final grade. And there's no way for you to fix that. What did you learn from that process? In theory, people will tell you, oh, well, the student now knows that they need to turn in their homework. They're facing the consequences of their actions. So therefore, they're going to turn in more and more homework to ensure their grade doesn't go further down. But we know in practice, that's not what grades do motivationally. In fact, you're more likely to not turn in future assignments because it demotivates you from wanting to continue. If you get a zero on an assignment, it feels bad and you tend to actually leave uh, that system as opposed to engage more in it. So there's two things really going on here, right? So there's what you're talking about there where say you miss the, um, the homework assignment, your homework grade gets dinged. And then let's say that there are stakes attached to your letter grade, either as it relates to GPAs or class ranks, as you said, there's like a status threat that's there, or even sometimes schools will use your, your grade in a class um, to sort you into, to track you into the next class. So whether you're eligible to take the next section or eligible for honors or some of those other th programs that exist too. And it could, it could not even be about your summative performance because maybe you, you knew it and maybe you could show that you could do it on the summative, but you just missed that homework because you had a band concert that evening and you were just too busy and went home and went to, went to bed instead, right? You're penalized, as they were saying in the video, for those things that are outside of class. And those have real consequences then on class rank, GPAs, on tracking, if that's a thing that your school does. So that's really part one. Part two then is, again, let's return to this idea that on a zero to 100 point scale, 60% of that scale is represented by failure. Well, if we're looking at the scale that we have here, if we started at 50, well, then it's only in 10% um, differences then that, eat, that represent each range, right? So an F is still 50 to 60. A D is 60 to 70. A C is 70 to 80, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all the same thing. It just, it, it puts failure on the same uh, uh, standing as passing grades D, C, uh, B, and A. There seems to be an assumption here that the way the status quo of grading was working before right. the system was benefiting students to learn responsibility. And we know from an overwhelming amount of research that is not the case.
because students who do poorly in school don't do better yeah. in the long term because they're getting low grades. Chris, we were talking about how this is an old idea. This is an article from Educational Horizons. This is available from the Department of Education from the summer 2010. And it's looking at stuff that's obviously far older than that on the question of do minimum grading practices, which an example would be, if you don't turn in work, you get a 50% instead of a zero, right? Lower academic standards and produce social promotions. And they, they, you know, they walk through what the controversies are and all these other kinds of things. This picture is real interesting here on the second page gets exactly to what you were talking about, right? You know, that zero really prevents you from actually attaining um, a higher grade. And it is, it is like a ball and chain. Struggling students are often labeled as uninterested or lazy, yet the problem may not be so much students' lack of motivation, but instead too much motivation in the wrong direction. So, uh, achievement motivation, locus of control, att attribution theory, self-worth theory, self-efficacy all predict that common grading practices, such as grading for effort, using grades as rewards and punishments, and assigning punishingly low grades often both encourage and produce results opposite from those intended. Such practices can invoke the same self-destructive behaviors educators are trying to mediate. And they cite me from 1992. I was six years old in 1992 while putting out those journal articles, man. Like the, there's this false myth that grades are motivators and there is right. not. Like it's just, this is not how it works. This is the equitable grading practices page from the Oregon Department of Education, which is where Portland is pulling the, the impetus for these changes from. And it's interesting to note that they define, as do pretty much every State Department of Education, the purpose of grades to clearly communicate a learner's academic progress and achievement. But then they get into inequitable versus equitable grading practices. And they talk about how grades can hey. impact student identity, behavior, and motivation. Grades can be highly variable among educators in the same school. And the accuracy can be significantly impacted by extra credit or differences in weighting. So therefore, they recommend interrogating your grading practices, talking about your own relationship with grades, how your experience with grading as an educator has been influenced as a, by a learner, to what extent do students know the purpose of grades and grading, and what biases someone has when it comes to their grading practices. To kind of, I guess, almost wrap things up and, and dive into addressing some of these points, I am referencing here a Reddit post, um, but... It, it, I, it has, if, as you see here, 395 comments nice. on it. So this is from the Portland subreddit. I, I think this is a good indicator of what's the normie response to this. Like, these, this is not an education subreddit. These are just parent community members, etc. So let's see here just like what are the top comments. First, speaking as a parent of two high schoolers, this change won't do anything to address the fundamental issues by underperforming students while it reduces rigor and adds confusion for kids on the college track. It won't accomplish anything, but at least we'll feel like we did something. Then someone responds, I think you nailed it. It fits the Portland mantra of feeling good about ourselves without actually accomplishing anything. Let's find the evidence that it reduces rigor and adds confusion. I, I think they're projecting their own insecurities and own misunderstandings about this onto the system itself. Um, I, I just don't understand this idea of that this is like some hippy dippy. Uh, we're just trying to do a kumbaya moment where right. we're trying to make everyone happy because is the purpose of education to punish children that do something wrong? I mean, there are certainly learning moments The your grades in school do have a pretty sizable impact on your future. And we shouldn't be working with, you know, 13 and 14 year olds and saying, okay, you're punished for this, this is going to impact you and your right. GPA for the rest of your high school career. At some point, kids are gonna have to face the reality that objective results matter. I want the best damn surgeon available to work on me in the operating table, regardless of socioeconomic background. I want the best damn architect to design buildings to withstand earthquakes, regardless of the color of their skin. I want the best damn scientists working on climate change, regardless of what type of home they grew up in. I believe deeply in equity for inputs, Blah, 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 all right? Well, what they're really arguing for is the abolition of the zero to 100 grading scale anyway, because, you know, the mantra that, that I often hear as, as it relates to college uh, and um, degrees, right, is that C's get degrees, or even in some cases, D's get degrees. And as far as I know, they don't put a GPA on your diploma. So as long as you're meeting the minimum threshold for whatever that program is, 
you don't have to be the best damn surgeon to go and become a surgeon, right? You have to be able to do the surgery successfully 100% of the time without killing your patient. <laughs> and that's not a 75%. That's not an 80%. That's a 100% all the time, okay? And so we want to change the conversation from grades to like what it is that we're evaluating and assessing, which is competence. Do people that follow this line of thinking believe that architecture firms are going to see the fact that more high school students potentially have higher grades and therefore are just going to let them circumvent architectural practices like we share the same concern but equitable grading practices are right. meant to actually make these things better people aren't just going to take grades at face value whether or not you change the grading system or you keep it the same because grades yeah. are already all over the place a high school diploma is basically a participation trophy at this point if they really care about equity they should have lower class sizes and improved access to reading instruction at early That's levels and Kids having poor reading comprehension is more closely tied to socioeconomic background and literacy is the biggest potential hurdle to advancing after grade three. It sounds like PPS is trying to pump up their performance. metrics. I, I mean, why does it have to be either or? Why can't it be, oh, we can't do um, equitable grading practices that make sense mathematically. That makes sense given what we know about how brains work and how kids are motivated. Um, and tackle lower class sizes and address poverty. That's where we look at systems. You know, it's not about this, that, or the other practice. It's how do all of these systems support or how do these systems um, work to produce results that are uh, dehumanizing or, or undesirable? Right. And it's also worth noting, too, this idea that, like, you know, schools nowadays are just failing kids and everyone just oh isn't God. either learning anything anymore or graduation rates don't mean anything anymore. Does that mean that everyone who went to school in the 1960s, 1970s are just like dumb dumbs versus the people today? Because it looks to me like test scores over time have gone substantially up. Like it's a play into their argument. Test scores have gone up over time if we're going to use these metrics. Um, so it's not like schools nowadays are, are any different than they, than they were. Speaking as an engineer, it was very apparent when students lacked fundamental skills in university. They simply didn't survive the coursework and left for easier, less lucrative majors or left for good, saddled with unusable debt. This seems like PPS setting students up for failure. 100% instead of covering up deficiencies, they should be providing efforts on helping these students as much as possible reach a base level of proficiency. Otherwise, the feel good is going to completely F over these kids when they strive for adulthood. I think that people are missing the point yeah. because that's literally what they're doing. They're helping students reach a base level of proficiency because the conversation doesn't stop at you got a five out of 10. It actually talks about having reiteration and feedback being implemented because even if you didn't complete any of the assignments, you still failed. They're not getting rid of Fs. 50% is still uh, like, uh, it, It's still not passing. The traditional grading system does not help students do anything that they're talking about here. This system that allows for feedback and reiteration actually has students focusing more on those fundamental skills because this is a problem. Like, yes, not, students not having fundamental skills to be an engineer is a serious problem in schools. The traditional grading system right. is not assisting with that. We are not doing kids any favors by taking away consequences by not doing work on time or doing incomplete work. It's also not fair to the students who actually are working yeah. hard to get their work done correctly. Kids need to fail to get better and learn. This is ridiculous. The soft bigotry of low expectations. Again, a, what, a two-decade-old, maybe even pushing three-decade-old kind of meme at this point, you know? The, the mantra of the top-down education reform movement, which, again, uh, super successful, <laughs> obviously, just given the, the state of the country and, uh, and of education systems that we live in in their image. Um, it's very frustrating to see this because it really is we know that grading systems like this predate any kind of modern understanding of cognition, of motivation, of how kids actually learn and act and interact and are influenced by the structures and systems of school. It's fascinating to me, you know, Reddit sorts by, by default on the most upvoted comments, and it's a pretty overwhelmingly negative uh, response. 
Um, this person says, when you put a zero on a kid, you're putting a value judgment on them, right? Quote unquote. This is so damn stupid. No, I am not judging them. They earned that zero by choosing to not do the work their classmates, classmates did do. Again, something I, I hear a lot from more, I guess, authoritarian um, teachers, this idea that students are earning their poor grades. And isn't this comment proving the point of the reforms in the first place? They earned that zero by choosing not to do the work when the reform itself cites all of the reasons why kids may not be able to do homework at home compared to other kids who have more advantages and are able to get it done and earn higher grades on homework that then right, create this divide between haves and have nots. It also is a judgment. This comment yes. is a value what judgment doing. on them. Um, I mean, is there... And I'm not again, judging them. None of this is to say. I know <laughs> this isn't to say that teachers don't have a, an impetus to work with students who are turning in assignments late, right? Or to work with students who are cheating. They're addressing that. They actually now have mechanic, mechanisms in place where they're going beyond the t the simple task of assigning a grade. If I cheat on an assignment and get a zero, okay. Like that, that doesn't do anything to address the fact that I cheated on the assignment outside of punishment. I didn't want to do that assignment anyway. Well. That's why I cheated. But if so you make punishment me have to not do, do it, excellent. Uh, same thing with like, if I, I turn an assignment late and get a lower grade, grades are not good motivators. Now someone's going to have to actually work with me. And you, you can make the argument like maybe Portland isn't doing that. Like maybe the, the systems are not set up to actually make these practices equitable. And that's a perfectly valid criticism of, you know, if people are not having those proper supports. But this is a first step to starting to talk about those things. A quick, quick um, anecdote here. I was teaching U.S. history class, and I had a student who um, basically copied and pasted portions of an assignment into the work that they were supposed to do. It was pretty obvious. So I handed the assignment back to them with the highlighted portions and basically was just like, hey, you, you copied and pasted this, right? And the policy for, the, for my department at the time was to put a zero in the grade book, right, fail them and move on. That's not going to help me build a relationship with this kid. So I turned it back to him and then had a conversation afterwards because they were really kind of ashamed, you know, that they got, got caught up in it and ended up saying like, yeah, you know, I was working, I was rushed, um, I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I said, I said hey, here's the deal. We'll, we'll um, go ahead and let's, we'll, I'll sit down, we'll redo the assignment, you know, I'll, I'll help you out with this thing. And we'll give you like, I, I forget, I, I took off a certain percentage on it. So he would still get like a passing score, but it would be dinged by a lot, right? Um, because I, I wasn't into being super radical during my first year teaching. And he was all into it, put in full effort on it, knew that he was going to take the ding on it. Um, so not only then did he turn, do the work, turned it in, took the grade hit, right, for better or worse, built the relationship with, with me as an educator, but then years later, um, is working at a bank that my parents um, uh, go to. And of course, you know, my, my, my dad walks up and like says his name. It's like Covington. Oh, oh, you know, uh, Nick Covington at all. And my dad, of course, like, oh yeah, that's my son. And this student was like, goes best teacher I ever had and mentioned the cheating thing said caught me, you know, cheating on this, on this thing. Didn't let me get away with it. Um, you know, worked with me to, to do it better. And so it's like, again, another example of how we're, we're not just building in the moment, right? We're building for, that was a lesson that this student took away for the future about like what grace and recovery and things in those situations look like. Is it just punish and move on? Or is it, hey, let me try to work with you here within the confines of the system to do things better. Actually building on that with the exact same thing, we'll do a couple more of these, but I mean, check this one out. This person says, if anything, children from disadvantaged backgrounds are going to need to learn to be more independently resilient than their peers. And that includes learning how to pick yourself back up after failing. These kids don't have the support systems that wealthier kids have. They won't have someone to hook them up with a good job, lend them extra money for rent, help them out with a car repair bill, even emotional support. The world outside of school is cruel and unforgiving. You need to learn some basic discipline to just stay afloat, let alone actually get ahead. And in addition to the argument that I keep saying over and over again, that traditional grades don't do this. We know they don't do this. They know, we know they just push kids out of school. It doesn't motivate them to keep doing well. It doesn't learn that kids who don't do well in school tend to be pushed out of school and find themselves in situations where they can't support themselves. The, the grade did not help them <laughs> uh, learn how to 
work through failure. That's just not what they do. But I also want yes. to bring up this quote from our just gonna pull that last out. video. So this quote from Haim Ginat, uh, as I believe it's now actually pronounced correctly, is true that modern life is often like a rat race. People struggle to be first in line. They push, wrestle, insult, and lie. Do we want to prepare children for such life? No. On the contrary, we need to tell children that rat races are not good for people. We want school to be not a replica of, but an alternative to raw reality. Such a school needs teachers with sophisticated sensitivity and effortless empathy. The purpose of school is not to reiterate upon the dehumanizing elements of our world at large. It's to build a better world. And the way that you do that is you have conversations with kids as opposed to just judge, demean, and harm them. And giving a kid a zero is harmful. Even if the kid is annoying, even if the kid gets on your nerves and pushes your buttons, even if the kid is not doing anything and they probably could, the solution to that is not just causing harm to them by giving them a zero. It's working with them and having conversations with them and teaching them, which is if we blow this up to the 30,000 foot level here and just ask like, well, hey, doesn't punishment work on the grand scale, right? Can't we punish our way into having a better society? Let's just throw exhibit A of the United States having the largest prison population in the entire world. So if going to jail was a deterrent, right, we would have the safest, you know, we would have the, the lowest crime rates in the world. And in fact, the opposite is true because we've invested so much architecture and infrastructure into um, punishment whether it's you know policing in prisons that we don't have the infrastructure for positive supports for you know actually building constructive visions of the future so right what this person is talking about which is like oh you know the world is cruel we got to need to make schools in that image again that's just reiterating and it's going to replicate the same patterns of the outside world outside of school what portland is doing is they're taking an active role in trying to break those patterns. That's why it's called an equitable grading system. Finally, someone got to like an actual comment here. It's really buried. This only has two upvotes. It was the first one I found, (laughs) the first positive assignment. Here's a teacher. A lot of people on this sub are misunderstanding what equitable grading means. Essentially, it is about the grade accurately representing what a student is capable of in relation to their performance on grade level standards instead of behavior. Old school grading, such as points for completing work, points for participation, et cetera, has more to do with reflecting student behavior more than skills and knowledge. Equitable grading aims to simply reflect student achievement accurately and consistently. In traditional grading systems, you could be a C student on all your tests and projects, but be on time, turn everything in, and do some extra credit and come out with a B or even an A. A different student could also be an A student on all their assessments, but be absent a lot, turn things in late, and be disruptive in class and wind up with a C. Equitable grading aims to only reflect assessment data instead of behavior I like the reply. Quality, substantive comment, <laughs> completely ignored by the I, I just like, this threat. Thank you, <laughs> Poutini and Coach. coach. Nice. It sucks because grading practices have always been controversial, right? Because there's such a, a personal reflection, both of teaching and pedagogy and systems, and like everybody has experienced them. So your success in it or not, you know, you, again, internalize as part of your identity. I was able to be an A student, and that meant a lot to me, or you know, I failed in the system and yada, yada. Um, So people are just, but but today people are putting it through that culture war lens. And you see that like in the homeschool comment or like the soft bigotry of low expectations kind of thing where it's like, man, now it's all about this far left project for equity and it's going to set up these kids to fail and all these kinds of things. And again, it's, it doesn't even need to get to that point. It just says, when was, when was the grading system created? What was it intended to do? Did it do those things well or not? And what do we know now about how learning and motivation work? Right. You learn through right. struggle, but this is not struggling. Uh, learning through struggle is not getting an F and then failing out of a class. Learning through struggling is someone who sits next to you and makes you consistently reiterate upon an assignment until you do better. And if we're following these guidelines to a T, that new system is what's in place. It has educators working with young people to implement feedback and iterate upon their assignments as opposed to just stopping the conversation there and assuming that this natural sorting mechanism of grades in school are going to lead to equitable outcomes. I would rather have a district attempt to implement equitable grading reforms and move towards the systems that we talk about in our PD and work, um, which I think even takes us a step further about moving away from grades as much as possible. 
um, even beyond the A through F grading scale. I would rather have a district take steps to do that as opposed to just accept the way things were before was working in some way, shape, or form because it, they weren't. Um, it, we need to take steps away from the problems that grades yep. solve. Sure do. Hey, thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. Check out our funding drive on our website, humanrestorationproject.org, and leave a comment with what do you think about equitable grading practices?